So good morning, good afternoon to everyone, wherever you are, <laughs> different places. Uh, and uh, I'm super excited today to welcome you all to hear some presentations and updates from our fellows, uh, three of our fellows, Kadni, Niba, and Israel. And uh, so this has been a culmination of a couple, several months actually, of just engaging and, and assisting them as they develop their projects uh, and really We've been a partner in this process, um, being listening to uh, the challenges they're facing and helping them design and build uh, their projects. And so today is more of a, uh, an update and, and hopefully you guys can jump in and as well and share your feedback on some of the things that they're building. Um, I'm super excited to just see where things are for, for all of them. Um, so, so, so yeah. So just as uh, I want to also welcome a couple of people that are with us today. Um, so Morgan and Riley, our new summer interns, welcome to both of you. Super excited to have both of you um, here with me, here with us today. Um, and also we have two guests, uh, Gore Loveline um, uh, and Adriana, both of whom are prospective new members. And so I'm super excited to have them both join us today. Uh, to learn more about SAI and check us out um, as well. A couple of updates. Um, I want to, I'm sure some of you have seen this. Um, Prasha, I just want to send a congratulations to her. I don't think she's on the call right now, but she was selected as a TEDx fellow. Um, big news for her project, uh, just for all the work that she's doing. So really excited about that. Uh, we got, uh, as you saw in the email to everyone, we got the stories and science um, trademark uh, approved as well, which is, which is huge. And um, the most recent news that is not public right now, and since you guys are all here, I'll tell you, is that we were awarded a grant from the Burroughs Welcome Fund uh, to support the fellows program, actually. So this will be for the year and it's gonna be slightly revamped and, and we're now thinking about, about that completely virtual and they, they, they really love this fourth iteration. You heard me right, fourth iteration. Uh, so different years we've applied, um, four years, and this is the last, the, the third, fourth time was a charm. So <laughs> uh, lesson here is keep trying, okay? Don't give up. Uh, sometimes it's gonna be hard, but you have to keep going. So we're super excited about that. And, and so, um, and without further ado, I wanna start, start get, uh, get going is, Courtney here, or um, we can have Niba go first too. I think uh, she was she was ready to go anytime. But uh, if uh, if that's okay, let's see. Is she here? No, not yet. Okay. So um, Niba, would you mind starting us off? Fantastic. So I'll just say a quick word here. So Niba, um, it's been fantastic working with Niba over the past couple of months, just seeing this project grow. And and uh, both Jessica and I were super excited when she sent us the proposal on email. And this is how they work. The people just send us proposals and, and we read them and we're like, yes, this is fascinating. Let's figure out how to help you. And and when she sent us the project, and I won't spoil to the, her, her, her spiel, uh, we both, Jesse and I, were like, "Yes, let's 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 see where this goes." And we are always looking for really cool ideas, different ideas. Uh, and it's been fantastic to work with Niba um, over the months, and uh, and you are going to be with us still. So this is super exciting. So Niba, take it away. All right, um, I am very excited to talk to you guys. Give me one second to share my screen. How's this look? Looks good? All right, I can't hear anyone, so. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, hi guys. Uh, I'm a recent fellow of SAI. I'm gonna give you guys like a really quick overview of what I'm gonna be covering today so you know where we're standing. Um, just a little bit about me, what the problem is that I seek to kind of address in my science communication. As you guys know, my brand is Notes by Neba, so I'll go into the actual notes, how I quantify how each of them are working. And since this is a lab meeting sort of style, um, I have a couple things and ideas that I've been pondering for the past couple weeks. And I'd really like to get your guys' feedback on those, especially at the end. Um, but if you have any feedback anytime, feel free to drop it in the chat. And if I don't see it, Fanwell can notify me and we'll be good. Um, so a little bit about my history. I was born in California and I went to UC Davis. UC Davis is a very huge school for plants. And that's where I got really interested in plant genetics. 
But while I was in college, I also developed um, an interest in fashion. So I became a model to try and help for paying with things and just kind of like, just as a creative kind of side hobby. But it wasn't until I got to grad school that I realized um, fashion and plants just have quite a lot in common. So in grad school, um, I'm actually going to be graduating right now. I am a Duke master's student and I have been studying plant genetics for the last seven years. So this is where kind of my two interests of plant science and fashion really came together. So when we take a look at the cosmetics industry, it is worth quite a bit, um, billions and billions of dollars, uh, sometimes those dollars being part of tiny small indie companies or small owned businesses and other ones as large as Kylie Jenner's who has quite similar products, but they have quite the markup with the brand label associated with it. So this is a little quick chart of looking at what exactly is the components that goes into a simple red lipstick. And when we take a closer look at some of these, we can see that a lot of these components come from plants, which are everything that is in green marked, or they are reliant on plants. When we look at castor oil that comes from the castor plant, when we look at beeswax that comes from plant nectar, plant pollen, other waxes is usually referring to waxes that are derived from sheep. Um, lanolin especially is a wax that's derived from sheep. What do sheep eat? Plants. Um, a lot of dyes, pigments, perfumes, they come from crushed insects, which mostly eat plants, or they come directly from plants. Um, and when we look at another portion of the fashion and beauty industry, it's textiles. Textiles are generally just kind of low valued at the beginning, but with this huge movement towards sustainable fashion, sustainable beauty, the way in which we use these textiles has been really starting to come under scrutiny. So um, that kind of brings me to my main point here, which is that plants are just really essential for all walks of life, whether that's in medicine or in food or even in cosmetics and fashion. So I focus a lot of my plants, my communications on looking at how we can communicate the importance of science behind these like lifestyle ideas, but especially in plant science, because that's where my like major and my understanding really lies. So there's this term called plant blindness, which is basically this concept that as humans have kind of evolved and gotten farther away from this agricultural nomadic style of life, those styles of life, um, We've moved into an era where grocery stores are how we see food and textile like clothing is really seen in looking at going like shopping for the final product. And we've, we're missing how so much of this is so reliant on plants. And even though plants and plant science play such a key role, they're full of these industries are full of just unregulated ingredients there's a lot of pseudoscience marketing there's things saying like oh natural is better when that's not always true natural may not be the most sustainable way so ultimately my mission is to try and explore the science behind cosmetics and fashion and skincare to enable everyone who looks at my content to basically scientifically choose more efficient products and more effective products and products that are a little more eco-friendly um, there's a lot of discourse about how fashion that is sustainable is rather expensive. So it's a weird balance and I think it's really important to try and be inclusive of every single person's different uh, financial needs. So thrifting is one way that you can kind of get around that. So I kind of lie at this weird intersection of plant science and art because a lot of my followers are like beauty bloggers or skincare bloggers, but at the same time it is science. So a lot of my followers are just scientists or people who are interested in this science. So this is a sample of like what I think is a good depiction of what my brand is kind of like. So this is taken from Instagram where I talk about, I created a photo to kind of indicate just something red about red leaves and something that was catchy. Um, a lot of this photo I chosen specifically because it got such high engagement, a lot of reshares, a lot of reposts. Um, and it's just a good depiction of kind of this concept of like when tree, when leaves turn red, it's because of this particular scientific concept. And here's a depiction of how that is. Um, another thing I have found is so since I'm on Instagram as my primary medium, we can maximize insights. There's obviously the polls in terms of, you know, engagement, likes, shares, whatever that you can swipe up and see. But uh, Instagram's ability to have polls, I'm sure you guys have seen these before, can be really used for science prior to posting something and even after posting something. So in this photo, I had done like just kind of an artsy shoot with a dried rose and asked, what is it that makes flowers orange? Carotenoids is the correct answer. 
And we can look at the poll answers looking to see how many people to decide like, you know, what they think it is. And one interesting thing about this is that you can ask this poll before and after you have made a post. So that can kind of help indicate like, you know, how many people have really read your post, how many people have understood its content. And that is something that Instagram insights will not give you and is something that's absolutely key for any kind of science communication. Another thing um, kind of following this vein of like splitting your posts across time is um, leading up with a question. So this is a monstera plant that has holes in its leaves. And by asking the question, does anyone know why these exist? You can get little responses, you know, like people don't know, they might have even guesses or clues to kind of what that reason um, is. And then coming up on the next day, you build a little bit of interest and then the next post can get even higher engagement. Um, this next part is especially relevant to the times. Um, the beauty industry is a very white centric area. Um, as a model, I experienced various forms of you're too dark, you're too light, you're too skinny, you're too fat. Just it's people are very, very um, blatant about what they want in a viewing, viewing your clothes, they're viewing their clothes on you. But how do you navigate this industry that defines beauty to be white? How do you scientifically navigate it, not just in inclusive communications, but also in inclusive brand recommendations. For example, there's a lot of brands that do sustainable work, but they are full of, of pictures like this. And I just, I can't support that. Um, I think now more than ever, this is incredibly important and should be at the forefront of people's minds. And it should be something that we think about, not just now, but before now, now and into the future. So when I look at brands that I choose to support and brands that I'm even willing to consider working with or promoting or writing for or doing photos for, I look for brands that actually value diversity and have not just valued diversity for the past week um, because there's quite a lot of those popping up and I don't trust them until they have proven that they can follow through with their action statements. Um, Aerie is a brand, a women's underwear brand that works a lot with trying to be more sustainable and they have had inclusive campaigns since I want to say at least 2014, 2013. So it's been quite a bit of time. So you have to actively look for brands and partnerships that back up your science. And obviously this is beauty, so it's going to be a little bit different for you guys. But when you guys are chosen to sit on panels about science, when you're chosen to appear on podcasts, take a good hard look at who they're inviting. Take a good hard look at who else you'll be sitting on these panels on. And you can just refuse to sit on panels that are full of all white people or have no accessibility if they don't have text on screen for people who cannot see. These are ways that you too can make a difference in science communication and making it more inclusive. So when diversity is trending, um, it's, it's, it's tricky to navigate such a situation. Um, my brand has been pushing to have diversity and include things about skincare for people of color, for people of melanin, for people who do not have this kind of like typical white look that people just seem to think the world has. So this is a post I made quite a bit of time ago. I want to say like three, four, a couple weeks ago. Um, I just pulled a recent one to talk about how if you have some melanin, it's possible that sunscreen will give you like a white cast. And it's important to kind of stay relevant, um, especially with the movement. You don't want to be posting things just because they're trending. You want to be posting things because they are relevant to what's trending and they are relevant to your brand. And finding this intersection, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is incredibly important. So yesterday I made a post talking about how to support black owned businesses. This is a movement that is incredibly important, um, pushing the kind of uh, importance of supporting minority businesses, pushing how important they are. Um, and that's kind of how you can try and find a way to meld these interests. I don't think it's possible to meld interests every single time, and that's incredibly important. Do not try and force it if you can't force it, because then it's just going to be obvious and painful, and especially at a time like now where people's lives are at stake, it just is disgusting. So make sure whatever it is that you're posting when stuff's relevant is actually relevant. Um, another thing that was kind of tricky for me was in staying relevant is when COVID-19 hit. As you guys know, a lot of science kind of rocketed sky high. Suddenly people were like, oh my gosh, this is important. And it's tricky to kind of decide like, you know, how do you talk about the science that goes into like lifestyle really when COVID is hitting? And then I think a little more, what are my, what are my brand? What is my goal? 
And I realized a lot of stuff that's going on with COVID C is vitamin C. A lot of people at the beginning of this pandemic thought that vitamin C supplements would somehow protect them from the virus. And as a result, people were buying vitamin C in like huge quantities. And there was just like, you know, people were running out of vitamin C, which is not a huge deal for most people. But for some people, they actually have deficiencies. They have issues with absorbing vitamin C. They might have a special illness that requires them to have more. And so trying to explain why it is that vitamin C is useless is really useful and kind of on brand. Where does vitamin C come from? Plants, yet again. Um, vitamin C is also used in a lot of skincare and it's used to kind of brighten up your skin and that sort of thing too. I didn't include those posts here, but that's just sort of an idea to give you guys a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, lastly, I know we only have you know, 10 minutes for this, so I'm not going to get super into detail. I just wanted to give you guys an overview, but my primary like method of communications I'm trying to shift more into is video communications. Um, this has been a tricky field to navigate, especially with the rise of TikTok. Um, I think that video has a lot of power in terms of it's a podcast, it's text, it's photo, it's video, it's it, like just everything all in one. It does require a lot of work, a lot of time, but people will look upon it very, very, um, brightly if you have like a brand that has like an introduction video or an explainer video um can you guys see my pointer someone just nod yes okay great um so this particular one right here virtual classroom visits featuring skype a scientist this was a brand partnership i did with skype a scientist which connects um scientists into classrooms all around the world and this one was really useful because it was just an explainer video that kind of showed how a scientist would use it, how a teacher would use it. And they found it really useful. They put it on their um, Twitter and they like shared it on their sites. So um, if anyone wants a video, hit me up. If anyone wants to learn video, talk more video, let me know. Um, one thing that I will touch on now is analytics. So um, I don't know if is Prasha here, maybe because I want to reference something that she said in a meeting. She's not. Um, Prasha, during one of her meetings, uh, creator of her STEM story, she mentioned something about how she measures her growth of podcasts by tracking the number of podcasts that she records and then not by tracking the amount of downloads it has. So what she was really talking about in economic terms there is leading versus lagging indicators of success. When you are kind of starting out a brand, you can't really be checking how it's working by these lagging indicators of success. You want to check it by something that is a leading indicator. So you see like where things are really going. Oops. Um, so one thing I've been working on is just tracking how much time uh, I'm spending on all of these things and where I am with all of those. Um, so some of the tools that I use, this is for video primarily is TubeBuddy. Here's an example of what it looks like. Um, TubeBuddy will give you kind of like keywords, summaries, results. I think this will look really different depending on what medium you choose to use. Um, if you're using social media campaigning, Sprout is a really good one. If you're using um, tutoring, for example, you want to try and have like quantitative evaluations from both your students and your tutors to see how it's going. But um, as Fanwell will definitely tell you, uh, having quantitative metrics for your work is absolutely important. Um, another thing that I very recently developed as of literally 6 a.m. this morning is uh, a Gaunt chart. My media has started to get so big that it's starting to get like across so many platforms and so many different areas that I need to keep track of it. You guys may have seen a Gaunt chart before, but um, let me know if you guys need me to increase the size of this for accessibility. Um, but the idea is basically having a content calendar to lay out where you're putting things and make sure that across different um, media channels, you're promoting the same stuff. So if you have a Twitter for your tutoring, you might have um, a Twitter row right here with your tweet and the hashtags that you might be using or accounts that you would like to tag. And then at the top, you want to keep whatever your main brand, whatever your main platform is that you're speaking on, whether that's in person or it's through social media or it's talks, or if it's even just one workshop, the main thing needs to go up here and then some sort of like date up above that. So you can check like where you are in each of these things. One thing that you'll notice, um, yeah, sorry, did someone have a question? I don't think so. I think okay, just the mic thing. Okay, great. Um, one thing that you'll notice, this is a continuation from that previous um, Gaunt chart, is that things will have to bleed over. Um, when you look at kind of 
you're, if you're doing something that's a regularly scheduled programming type thing, um, you need some time to check in on it. You need some time after you've posted it to check in on it, to engage with your followers, to make sure you're promoting it across different channels. If you're releasing, for example, a workshop, how are you promoting it prior to the workshop? How are you following it up on it after the workshop? Um, these are just kind of metrics to keep in mind. And um, my brand is, uh, I don't want to say it's going through a shift, but with all of the COVID and things going on with graduation, um, I've taken like a one month pause. So I'm now moving into kind of re going into my pace again. So my pace really is one video every two weeks. Um, these are some video ideas I have thought of. If anyone has any comments on that, feel free to drop it in the box. Um, another thing I'm focusing more on is using more polls for analytics. Um, this can be yes, no questions, uh, open-ended questions. One thing that as of this morning, I've finally solidified a little bit more is um, beginning a podcast. Oh, yay, Prasha's here. Thanks, Prasha. Um, please talk to me afterwards. <laughs> so um, if you guys are in a SciComm or in podcast, um, contact me for that. But one thing I'd really like some feedback on is um, branding. I would really appreciate this because things are starting to get a little large. So um, Notes by Nebo content is science, plant science, and all this lifestyle stuff that's focusing on YouTube and Insta. And I've picked those specifically because they are visual platforms by which I can communicate this visual information. My Twitter is, um, it's just all my personal stuff. So it doesn't make sense to have it be Notes by Nebo, but it would be sense local, make sense to um, tag Notes by Nebo within like the bio, for example. Um, something that I'm kind of wondering about is more, how do you like choose how to make your website? Should you have like a personal website, a professional one? Should I separate my ones for Notes by Nebo versus my own one? That's kind of a one I'm thinking about. Um, and for podcasts, my podcast concept is uh, entirely separate from all of the work you have seen thus far. So that is another thing I'm kind of wondering is it's obviously going to be hosted on the typical podcast platforms, but also might need an Instagram, might need a Twitter. Those might need to be separated. Um, I have no idea how to go on theirs, but um, yeah, so that's my stuff so far, the directions I'm going. Um, take it away. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Neva. Um, just make sure that uh, we keep moving. I, I, we'll have time for questions. Don't worry. Um, and so does anybody have any immediate questions right now? There's a lot in there to unpack and we'll have time for that for sure. But any uh, quick questions right now, one or two? Or the, answering her questions as well at the end there. Um, what was the, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what was the name of the program for the for for the analytics? I thought that was really cool. Uh, which which analytics was it? The the Instagram analytics or the Gantt chart? Oh, I think it was the last one. The Gantt, it's called Gantt chart. Yeah. Let me type the name in here. Um, and if you search it chart if you search it on google there's some like templates and stuff you're gonna have to like kind of custom make it for you but it's really just made on an excel um so it requires a bit of like excel proficiency but it's really just a matter of like drawing a grid of like these are your dates every single right. call will be a date and um, there's some templates you can look at online okay thank you we'll take one more if i can follow up that question i wonder How much time do you find you have to spend on your Gaunt chart? Just does it, I mean, the setup maybe is the big thing and then afterwards it goes pretty smoothly or is it, oh, do you find it's a lot? I think uh, I try and spend like a certain amount of time at the start of every week or the start of every month. Um, I think you're saying things and your mic is muted, sorry. <laughs> no, it's just nodding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I think it depends on how large that like top piece is for you. So if you're working on like a full workshop or if you're working on one social media campaign, that large portion needs a lot of time at the beginning and at the end. Um, for me, it's one video every two weeks. So every two weeks I spend around, I don't know, like quite a bit of time just kind of thinking about it. And there's some evergreen content in there. So not everything has to be related. Um, but I would say it's extremely useful because there's days when, you know, there's other things in your life that become bigger. And those days are, it's incredibly important for, if, especially if you work on like social media algorithms, um, you need to keep posting, uh, even if it's like 
absolute nonsense. Like sometimes I've seen in, like influencers just post like absolute trash and then delete it the day afterwards because they need to stay on the algorithm. And I'm not a huge fan of that, which is why I really like the Gaunt chart as a means of like making sure there's some amount of content coming out at the day it's scheduled. Um, the initial like kind of push is a lot, but if you're kind of wondering whether it's worth the investment, um, I would suggest making like a very basic kind of simple one and then just see how you use it. And if it's a tool that works for you, you can get into more detail and make it kind of like adjust as you need it. Um, I think one thing that is incredibly important for SciComm is understanding that there's never going to be a time at which you are ready to start and it's better to just start and learn as you go because there's nothing that will prepare you for doing your work other than doing your work. And thank you so much, Neba. Uh, so just to keep things moving, please stick with us because I do have some comments and questions at the end there for you and feedback on your uh, uh, the branding question that you're talking about. Um, so each of the fellows, right, when they join us, um, they have to do a, a logic model uh, development. So it's a one pager and in that model, they go through the articulating the question, the solution, kind of the hypothesis, right, and then go through those uh, logical connections in their programming. So Niba has a beautiful one as well. Uh, and each of the following presentations as well do have that logic connection um, to their programming. And as Niba mentioned, you know, given what's happening right now as well, I think all the three projects you'll hear about today and you've heard about already from Niba, you know, they're, they are touching on this important content, this important topic of inclusion, of diversity, right? Uh, and, and so, and one of the key things about the program is creating these new um, tools or programming that touches exactly that, the underserved and then the underrepresented, especially thinking about science and society, right? And so, I'm excited to see sort of where this project goes, Niba, and how um, it, it evolves, okay? And I'm super excited to also welcome Israel, who will now tell us uh, about a, a program uh, that he's building. And this is really brand new. He was actually part of our Stories in Science team. And in talking with him over the past couple of months, it's uh, been kind of in intense. Uh, and just to see, it's been great to see him evolve a little bit. Um, and now he's trying to develop his own programming uh, from, from scratch. So Israel, you're welcome to join if you can just share your screen and the floor is yours. Yeah, of course, thank you. So hi everyone, um, my name is Israel Robinson. I'm a current undergrad at Tufts University, a major in biochemistry. And today I wanna to be talking to you about REIT's uh, Springfield Tutoring Program. So first I'd like to take you into uh, our mission. So um, our mission at REIT's is to connect Springfield uh, um, current undergraduates or college graduates from Springfield uh, with current high school students to provide e-tutoring and math and English uh, I feel like with this extra academic support, uh, students' performance will um, increase in the classroom and um, this will carry on to state and standardized tests. And one unique thing that I feel like the program has to offer is the fact that there are overlapping experiences between the tutor and 2D. And um, this for the tutor can be a, a means of motivation to give back to the student. And um, it can also be a, a bridge between the tutor and 2D, as we know that um, because rela relationships are really important to build um, when you're tutoring somebody. So next, I'd like to take you into the problem. So I want to say at first, um, I think Neva mentioned something that was a uh, very important. It was about staying relevant. I feel like it kind of applies here. And she was uh, referring to the COVID-19 pandemic. So at first, uh, Initially, I was thinking that it was important to provide tutoring and um, assistance to uh, struggling students because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But soon um, after some thought, some thought process, um, I began to realize that there was there was already a problem within uh, my school system that was the school system I was coming from already that I wasn't paying attention to, and I, I feel like that problem which has long been a problem was that teachers are limited in this of resources that they can provide to students. And um, as a result, um, students uh, suffer in the classroom 
and um, their success in the future is affected. So when teachers, uh, so one of the primary uh, goals of the teacher, um, I feel like from my time in the school system was to prepare us for uh, one of the state tests. So the state test that I wanna talk about today that the tutoring program kind of centers around a bit is the Massachusetts Comprehens Comprehensive Assessment System. So um, it's a test that's given to uh, students in every grade, but specifically I wanna talk about um, it being given to 10th graders because uh, in 10th grade, uh, the students must pass the test in order to graduate. So it's really critical um, for them to move on into the next grade and just move on and graduate and go to college. And the test, it covers math and English. And as I've mentioned before, teachers are usually structuring their curriculum around uh, this test so students can pass. So um, that makes our target population uh, 10th graders. And there are some other reasons that we wanted to have uh, 10th graders as our 2Ds as well, which was because um, when we work with 10th graders, it will allow us an adequate amount of time to gauge whether our program was working, is working for them because uh, they'll be graduating soon. They're, they're going to be rising junior soon and then they'll be graduating. So we can look at these numbers and discern whether um, the tutoring was uh, doing its job and helping these students out. And um, they face the largest risk because of the pandemic, um, I feel like, because the students have been out of school since March and um, it's now June. So they've been out of school for almost three months. So they're missing out on three months of uh, coursework that can't possibly be made up um, online. So I feel like with a, an, a helping hand from the tutors that this will help a bit. Um, so these are, this is our target population. So I feel like it's also good to take a look at what type of students we're dealing with. So. Um, this is the, the makeup of the Springfield Public Schools District. So as we can see with these numbers here, there's a large percentage of economically disadvantaged and uh, high need students. So uh, the D Department of Education, they define high need students as uh, students at risk of educational failure or otherwise um, in need of special assistance and support. And that can mean that they're living in poverty below their grade level, at risk for not graduating and um, other things. So what I wanted to paint here is that in addition to the teachers not being able to support these students when they're at home, it's hard to sort of find that support um, from family members in the household as well, seeing that uh, a good portion of them are economically disadvantaged and high needs. And these students, given that they go to college, will probably be a first generation students. Uh, so next I want to take you into um, the MCAS scores, uh, what I was talking about earlier. So here are the, um, the scores for Springfield. So in order to carry on and um, receive your diploma, students need to partially meet expectations. As you can see, a good number of students do partially meet expectations. Uh, but the thing is, I feel like we, uh, the state is selling the students short on partially meeting expectations because it essentially means that they perform fair on the test, but given that they have some time to, um, the rest of their time in high school to uh, brush up on their mistakes, they should be able to graduate. But this idea um, that they'll, they'll be able to make up on all those losses uh, isn't feasible to me. And um, I think their poor performance on just, just the state test will also translate into uh, other standardized tests like the SAT and, um, and just affect their going to college. So I also think uh, by looking at these MCAS scores, uh, it kind of explains why there aren't a large percentage of these students who are graduating from high school. So I highlighted um, specific subgroups that I thought were important to view. And these were likely the, stu the students who were struggling on the MCAS and failing to meet expectation or meet expectations or exceed expectations. And uh, to further put things into perspective, I feel like it's good to take a view at uh, some other districts around Massachusetts. So um, Cambridge, 
So students in Cambridge, as you can see, their numbers are a bit better than Springfield and like in some ways better than the state as well. And as you can see, um, it's reflected in their graduation rates a bit. So um, their graduation rates are, are higher than the ones I, sh I showed for Springfield. Not great, but they're still um, higher for those same subgroups. And uh, I'd further like to show Lexington. So um, Lexington, um, it's a small town. Uh, but the thing is uh, about Lexington, I feel like they have a ton of resources to offer students, especially um, even during a pandemic and in the classroom. And um, their graduation rates would reflect that and look similar to um, how well they perform on the MCAS. So um, their graduation rates are pristine almost for the subgroups that I highlighted. And I just wanted to show a side-by-side -side comparison of these different districts. So um, as you can see, uh, Springfield versus Cambridge on the left and Springfield versus Lexington on the right. Um, the other districts uh, perform much better than um, Springfield. Um, I forgot to mention the dots are showing the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding expectations. So uh, for Cambridge on the left, it would be 60% um, of them were meeting or exceeding expectations for the English MCAS and uh, around the same amount for the math MCAS. And as you can see with uh, Lexington, uh, uh, they're in the 90%. And again, uh, bringing it back towards the, the subgroups that I thought were important uh, to help. So the high need students and um, the economically advantaged, disadvantaged students. So what I really wanted to try to portray here is that students, but it's that they don't necessarily have the the resources in place to achieve the success that we want them to. So uh, as you can see, the high needs and the economically disadvantaged students are uh, performing better in uh, other places like Lexington and um, Cambridge. So it's definitely possible and we can make that work in Springfield as well. So I told you a bit about the problem. So um, the solution that I have in mind was the tutoring. So I wanted to take you to um, the tutoring approach. So I feel like most tutoring programs, uh, they just rely on um, communication between the tutor and the students. And um, that in some ways could be good, but at some ways I think you're at a disadvantage. Um, so based on that, I wanted to uh, reach to use uh, the teacher as, um, to communicate with the teachers in order to help um, better improve the um, student's performance in the classroom because uh, for the following reasons. So I believe that teachers and uh, tutors, they can work together uh, to ensure the student's success. Um, the teachers can inform uh, the tutors on the student's weaknesses and the best way to work with them. I feel like this is very useful to get the most out of a session and vice versa. The tutors can let the teachers know how uh, to best work with the student in the classroom. Um, also, uh, teachers and students can decide on benchmarks for um, the student to reach and watch their progress and see if they're um, hitting the mark. So, um, and also big thing with teachers is that they recognize hard work and are willing to reward students for the hard work that they put in the class. And um, so what will our tutors be doing? Um, so tutoring will be online and it will be at uh, any time the tutor and tutee agree upon. I feel like this is very important because again, seven, I, I can't remember in my head specifically, but 77% I think were economically disadvantaged. So I, I can imagine that means that students, especially those in the 10th grade are, are looking for jobs and um, to, to support their families and have to fulfill some household responsibilities. So if their teacher, their teacher may be offering extra help hours for some certain time and they're not able to make it, then they missed out on an opportunity. So I feel like this really addresses that issue there. Um, so tutors will meet with students weekly for an hour to address concerns uh, with the coursework and sort of to gauge their understanding uh, of the coursework and also like relay this information to the teacher to mark their progress. And there will be an open communication line uh, through the Remind app where uh, tutors, I mean, tutees can uh, contact 
tutors. And lastly, uh, tutors will have the um, opportunity if they want to, to hold small group sessions because uh, sometimes students work better when they're working with um, other students. So lastly, how will we track our progress? So after each tutoring session, uh, I feel like it's important to have online journals to keep track of the student's progress over time. Um, also, given um, that there, we have communication between the teacher, we can see how the student is performing in the classroom, that being on tests and quizzes. And in the long haul, we can see how they perform on the state and standardized tests. And ultimately, if we can increase graduation rates for these students. And some future ideas that I have for the program is implementing a mentorship in addition to tutoring. Uh, I feel like that was uh, pretty useful because again, we're, we're coming from similar background. We, we have overlapping experiences. I, I feel like this is a great way to connect with students in order for them to better visualize success and um, see their self maybe going to college and majoring in different things like computer science, economics, um, economics and uh, biology or any science majors. And I was also thinking of designating uh, tutors to work as sort of like TAs for teachers to assist um, um, the teachers, especially those at big schools because they can have hundreds of students. And that is all for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Israel. Is there one quick question um, somebody wants to ask uh, or comment for Israel? Yes, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, Gore Levine, go ahead. Okay, sorry, so my lights have went out, which is why I got bumped off the discussion. I came in uh, at the point where the data be was being shown for the differences in students' performance, I believe, uh, or graduation rates, one of those two. Um, so anywho, my question is related to the REACH model. I was curious if there is, uh, if you've already collected data, or this is the first time you're implementing the REACH model to say that the REACH model is like more likely to lead to success than okay. what's already happening. So I, I'm saying I haven't been able to collect data. So um, we're, we're going to be working with students soon, but it is that uh, I'm assuming that the REACH model will bring more success because I've had experience tutoring, that being like on the college level, like tutoring my fellow college students and um, tutoring high school students. And I feel like there's always just this lack of communication between the tutor and the student. And sometimes that can be a, a barrier to helping the student achieve some sort of success because sometimes uh, tutors, they don't always know, maybe, maybe don't always know what to do uh, with a, a student's assignment. and they're, they're just stuck. And sometimes I feel like that stops the student from making progress. I don't know if that answers the question, but since that's no longer a barrier, I'm seeing that as a, a way that we can have further success with tutoring. Hmm. I was curious about the link between the teacher and the tutor. It seems like that's the link you're adding into mm -hmm. an already existing model. So I, I, didn't, I didn't hear. So is that the link you're testing now or will be testing and you don't have any data for that? You're just making an assumption that if this is added here, the results could be better. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's the, 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 the assumption that right? you're going to test that hypothesis, right? Yeah. But what Gorilov is getting at is, I think there might be some existing data you can look into, some studies that have looked into this, and I'm sure there are uh, in terms of looking at that link. Um, and I would suggest perhaps looking at, you know, the TA model, the future idea you're thinking about, you should make that your present, I think. Um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I think the teachers work with them figuring out, you know, will this work? Talk to them, right? And I think, Gorlin, Gor you agree that, I think talking to the teachers and just hearing them directly, <laughs> yeah. uh, things um, will give you some insight. Yeah, a little bit of a customer discovery kind of thing where you go and talk to different persons to actually find out if this is something they actually want to in the first place. And two, I think it's important to, since you're working with economically disadvantaged students and you want to do online work, you want to make sure that the technological divide isn't there or present for the sample you're working with. Because otherwise, I mean, you just don't want to, I guess, test the basic premises that you're setting up for your work, if that makes sense. 
Of course, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so to keep going, uh, Cotney um, is up next, and uh, it's been great to work with Cotney the past couple of months. And um, Cotney, uh, the floor is yours. I'll let you do a quick intro. Um, could you try to share your screen? Let's see. Okay, can you unmute yourself and then we can uh, hear you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Connie Nelson. So um, I've been working on Millennium Science. I'm gonna share my screen right now. And so that's what I'll be presenting today. Um, so what Millennial Science is, is, is basically a non-for-profit that aids students, disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, um, just focusing on STEM programs and, and how can we facilitate a need for them. So, so far of last year, started about last year, we've been doing over 20 programs in the summer um, at library, working with libraries and doing, so the picture that you see here is, this was last summer and they were making um, DNA models um, out of candy and the age groups, they differ from like five years old to seven years old and teens. So we don't really try to, at first, this is, we transition, but at first we didn't try to make any mold, you know, if students wanted to come in and do these science programs with us, you know, everyone can come in. So here you'll see like teens more so in the back there, and they were helping out and they were doing it and they were helping answer questions and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we focus on aiding students in their educational goals. Um, they have aspirations of being in the science field. Um, that's what we try to generalize the importance of that. So say I have a lot of mothers and parents come to me, oh, okay, um, they want to do these, uh, they want to be a part of these events, but we try to keep the parents out and we just focus on the children's needs. What do they like? What are they interested? Do they like astronauts? Do they like um, biology, you know, things of that nature. So it's focused on the students. Um, it's a mentor-based structure. I feel that representation matters. So the people that work with me diversify completely across the board. So all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different races, um, and we help to we help to bring these students to understand from a more person to person point. Okay, I've I've been here, I've done this, but I still was able to be in this field and work on this and and et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we focus it on, on mentor base. And we currently work with libraries all over Long Island and New York City. Um, so in the areas that we focus on, they're mostly um, minority based areas. So right now we're working in um, Hempstead, New York, uh, Queens, New York, and uh, Baldwin, New York, and Roosevelt, New York. And we're working with those libraries specifically. Um, we've also started a new goal for this year that I've worked with Daniel with uh, for our after school program to measure the student success um, and growth. So come to me and the need is I want to do something in STEM. STEM interests me. I don't know where I wanna go in it, but this is something that I wanna do. Okay, great. Um, let's do this program that will keep students engaged for the four for the four years, and um, and we'll be able to help them and assist them whatever they need as far as um, college applications, um, letters of recommendation, and things of that nature for the entire four years. So you start off in ninth grade, and then you work your way up to twelfth grade. So pre-COVID, <laughs> we got pretty far. Um, we signed off with Uniondale High School in Hampstead, New York, and they are basically willing to have us come in and work with a small set of ninth grade students um, and being able to really see if we can put data to these 
programs because what I've been doing is working with different libraries doing different programs with different sets of children um, and teens so if we are able to have an after school program or kind of club like situation where I'm with the same students and we're, we're working on um, different goals, we could actually quantify the work that we've been doing. Is it working? What's not working? Um, and, and how are they improving in their not only in their life goals to for college, but um, in their aspirations of working in the STEM field? Do they continue to maintain that 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 um, that thirst for that field that they choose to work in. So if they are in biology, they're interested in biology, as the as the um as they continue in school from ninth grade to twelfth, are we able to continually stimulate them into wanting to stay in this profession? So the problem statement, um, improvement on college acceptance and graduation rates at Uniondale High School. And our mission statement was to increase those graduation rates and get STEM gear students accepted into college um, through motivational and college gear programs. So that was a little bit um, on that, that logic model. So some of the resources we needed to run the program was obviously the students, so the, the ninth graders. Um, we also will be working with CSTEP, which is a Stony Brook program for minority undergrad students. And they would be coming in and basically helping facilitate some of these programs. So it will be every week, for one hour a week. And it's really intensified because um, like Israel mentioned, after school, is, you have a lot of responsibilities. If you're not working or you have to you know, babysit another child. So we try to max it at um, one hour. So being able to have the, the seats at mentor group come in and help facilitate some of these programs is, is pivotal because we get a lot more done with more people um, if they're able to speak to them one on one, they can be able to help gear them to the end of the program. So, and then the guidance counselor, Ms. Pollard, um, would also be helping as, because as the years go by, we want to know what is the guidance counselor, what is the school doing already that we are, we are bringing help towards. So if you're already going over uh, college essays, you know, we don't want to continue doing the same college essays. Maybe we could do it a different way. I'll have, um, maybe we could just look at them, maybe, you know, things of that nature. So working closely with the guidance counselor and seeing what is already put in place and just having things in addition to that was really important. Um, and then on ninth grade activities. So during each week, so for the first week, students will be exposed to uh, the fields of genetics and astronomy and physics through interactive programming, basically understanding what is STEM, what does it do, um, what makes you interested in this, really diving in to the students' needs. Um, we're focusing on having a test that could just basically, not a test, but just a basic questionnaire that we can help the students understand what is it that they want to get out of the program, what can we help them, you know, and being able to have that at the end of the program too. Were we able to help you in this manner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, week two, just hands-on uh, programming, working with um, Brandon Jobs, he threw a robot, robot building activity. This way it's more hands-on, we're getting we're getting, we've already got them interested. And now it's more the fun stuff, you know, and things, finding ways in STEM that can continue to stimulate these students. And then week three, students will be asked to select three schools that have a strong focus on their major and guided in how to search for college admissions and statistics. So we get more into the nitty gritty um, of college work starting from the ninth grade because as they go on, we're gonna continue, but we wanna give them like a basis to start from. And then in week four, an early introduction to national testing. So here in New York, we start, um, students are given the PSATs at, in 10th grade. And um, it's a test that you has to be paid for and things of that nature. So, and you can get scholarships from, if you have a high school, 
poor grade on this test. So we introduced that in the ninth grade to get students prepared from early and um, giving a brief overview, visual, visualizations of the test, sorry guys, and um, its importance, you know, why these scholarships can help aid in their college funds, obvious reasons, and getting waivers to these students beforehand so they don't have to worry about, okay, how am I gonna pay for this? Um, and then week five, um, we're going to go over the process of creating SMART goals, and this is very, very important because we're going to be using these SMART goals once they learn how to do it throughout the program, um, throughout the four years, and getting them to be familiar with setting these goals so it'll help them, you know, get to where they need to in their classrooms, not just in the program, um, in the club that we have set for them. And then, um, and lastly, for the last week, we'll do an open table discussion um, and students will discuss what they learned, what they would like to learn for the 10th grade. Um, students will be given a synopsis of next year's pro program, you know, to look forward to and things of that nature. So overall, by the end of this ninth grade program, the outcomes that we're assuming would happen is that students will have pinpointed after the work with us. Um, and the C-STEP mentor group and all those other other people that we have working in the team. Um, students will have pinpointed two to three schools of interest for their in undergraduate education. Students will have learned basic principles of how to code. Students will get into the habit of using the acronym SMART to set and achieve goals on their own and that 100% and that of participants are registered to take the practice SATs for the sp following spring um, tests. Uh, okay, so that purpose. So I kind of went over the purpose just now. Um, COVID-19. So because of <laughs> beautiful COVID, I mean, the principal has mentioned that we're going to hold off on extracurricular activities as of now until um, we learn how we can manage all of the, all of the extracurriculars that they have at this school already and um, being able to have a distance, social distancing. So we're, we're, everyone's playing it by ear, but um, Millennial Science has been doing virtual programs. And this one that you see here, Froggy Front, a virtual dissecting experience. So on our website, we have a virtual lab. So it's basically where I do lab-centered um, events and I get students from these libraries and we partner and they get the Zoom links and everything like that. And um, we're basically explaining, you know, what, what each, depending on the actual event, you know, what it means to be a, a scientist, what it means to have um, dissections and, uh, and just reading from the script here, uh, we compared and contrast anim uh, excuse me, anatomical difference to frogs, to humans. So being able to show students, even while they're at their homes, this and you could still do and have fun with science. And that's always been the basis of millennial science. So being able to have those virtual programs, virtual labs, um, as we call them, and it's a picture of me facilitating one. Um, I think that was last week. And we have another one planned for this month. So we've done uh, seven in total virtual lab sessions, and I've did one in radiology where I showed the actual um, actual X-rays of broken bones, and we deciphered whether it was from a um, dislocation or was it a fractured bone. You know things like that, and, and the children really really enjoyed it, and they're free. You know, Millennial Science is focused on giving these students, giving back, and everything is free. We've partnered with the Junkin Laboratory, which basically does science experiments, and they have drinks and things like that. So, and they've been sponsoring a lot of our virtual events because they understand the need for science in these times. So that's been really fun. Um, in regards to the after school programs, we're still playing it by ear, how we're gonna go about that. And that is it. Um, you can follow us on our Instagram and our Facebook at Millennial Science and the website for updates on our next events, our virtual labs. Um, and we post updates regularly on our Instagram. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Courtney. Um, so 
th those were our three of our fellows uh, that presented today. Uh, we do have a couple other ones, but they will be talking today. Um, and so the floor is open now for discussion, questions, um, thoughts on any of the presentation. Um, and I, and I, I want to read a comment here from Adriana. Um, she says she, she did one year of virtual mentoring program in high school students for the NYAS uh, focused on developing leadership skills and working on college applications. Uh, she can share details if, if it helps you, um, Cotney. So I think that's, that's a great uh, idea, Adriana. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if you can just send it to me, Adriana, that'll be, that'll be forwarded to, to Cotney um, on that. So, so the floor is open, guys. I, I, I can talk all day long, but I'll shut up. So. If there are no questions, I can ask something. <laughs> um, I have a question for Israel. Yes. Hey, hey. Um, I really loved your presentation and you were able to get so much data, well, presumable data, um, with this with the schools and pinpointed the need. You know, Faniel worked with me a lot on pinpointing the need for students. I'm very focused on like just helping everyone any way I can, but um what, what, what was your, what was you, what, what helped you the most in um, being able to pinpoint the, the need and, and finalizing on what data would, would um, put your program at, a, at an advantage? Okay, so um, uh, I think I have to mention first that the data that I collected is from actually from the Massachusetts Department of Education. So all of this is like public data that I use. And it's oh, okay, like, okay. data, so I, I took advantage of that. And um, I guess from there on out, when I did like, after after some thinking, uh, I I looked at the different subgroups. I think I highlighted in one of my slides, and I, I looked at which subgroup of students was struggling the most, really, with the the um, with performance in the classroom. And once I identified it, I, I knew to sort of target my program towards that subgroup further, uh, I kind of specified it even more uh, with some thinking too, because like you said, I want to help all people. Like there are there are kids in every grade, K through 12, but right. just the, the idea of helping all of them all at once, like right now, the idea wasn't feasible. Um, mm -hmm. It's we'd like to at some point, but I felt like the best cohort to start off with yeah. were going to be the 10th grader. And, um, for the reasons that I said uh, in the presentation. Yeah. Does that answer your question? No, it does, definitely. Thank you. I think finding that problem is critical. Uh, understanding yeah. the problem too. So um, Faneuil worked with me on that. Um, finding the problem, I, I've gone all over the place. I think I've had like a ton of different problems until um, I found out like which one was probably the most appropriate. And it was this, I, I had to kind of I don't know, being from the actual school system kind of helped me visualize what the problem was. Right. So I pulled myself back and like, what was some persisting problem that I and all students would always have? And it was just like getting help from the teachers at some point, like because right. they just have so many students. And um, sometimes you can stay after school to get extra help from the teachers. Other times you can't because like the data showed 77% of students were economically disadvantaged. I know with my parents, like when I had to stay after school, I had to catch about three buses to get back home. Yeah. And sometimes that's just not an option for students and just like with everything else they have going on in their life. So I felt like that was big. I'm sorry, last question. So my follow-up would be, so you just want to stick, are you going to be continue working with the 10th grade just, you know, over time? That's the so focal point. Over time, I, so first I'm starting off with the 10th graders at one school. Before I start moving into other grades, I'd like to move on to like 10th graders at uh, all the high schools in Springfield at first, mm -hmm. and then uh, consider moving on to uh, different grades. And I think like the next grade would be probably the ninth grade. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So each, as I mentioned earlier, everybody has a logic model and you know, the problem is the first thing they have to do. Okay, and then walk through all the connections and uh, Gorlin, and I know you you're like into evaluation, okay? And so she's <laughs> we, we started talking recently about this. Uh, what are your thoughts just about 
thinking about evaluation from a program design point of view, whatever they may be, right? It could be any tool. What are your, what's your advice in general? Well, and as I'm thinking about these programs and especially as I consider Cotney's presentation, I was, I was, I got, I guess I got, got a little stuck on the problem statement and the mission statement. I really appreciate the mission statement, but when I come back to the problem statement, I feel like it's not specific enough. You need to go a little bit more into detail about your, like you're thinking about smart goals for the kids, but you also need to think of course about a smart goal for yourself or for the program. So if you frame your problem statement as a smart goal, that will definitely help you when it comes to assessment towards the end if you were actually successful in meeting uh, what you had set out to meet because um, and i also think it's important and i'm not sure how much research has gone into this yet but it'd be important to look at um, um, i think you had in the problem statement college acceptance rates right or I, I forget what your actual statement No, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I did mention that. Mm -hmm. So you have two concepts in that problem statement, I believe, right? The first is mm -hmm. a college acceptance rate, and the second is, I forget what. Graduation rate, <laughs> yeah. Right, graduation rates. So those, uh, I am curious how, how much of an exploration you have done. So I know you're thinking about like problem scope and wanting to help everyone, but like just pick one school and it seemed like you picked one school. So go into detail, like doing a case study sort of thing, like go in with your detective lens and look for what, like, what is the problem in terms of college acceptance rate and in terms of graduation rate at this particular school. And talk to, talk to all different types of stakeholders at the school. Talk to the students, talk to the teachers, talk to the counselor, talk to the principal. Uh, talk to like the after school persons. It seems like there are after school people there. All of them are likely to give you different type of information to like, that would help you really figure out where exactly the problem is when it comes to the college acceptance rate and comes to graduation rate. And then think about how and if that problem that you've now identified by talking to so many people actually links back to the program you've designed, right? I, I see I see you have a beautiful design program that's related to STEM, but I'm curious to see or understand if uh, doing those types of activities, the STEM activities are actually um, linked back to or could increase uh, the acceptance rate or uh, you know, college graduation rate. And those two things, I believe, like, especially if you, I don't know what grade you're wanting to focus on, but if you pick a grade, um, I think it'll, there'll be some lag time between you can actually identify when the college acceptance happens or if it happens and when the graduation happens, right? So you also want to think, and that's like a long-term goal, but you want to think in like many terms as your program um, or short term, is your program actually accomplishing what you set out to accomplish in terms of your SMART goals? So it's really important to be very specific about your goal to be able to figure out uh, which, so that you can measure. So you need to be measurable in the first place to know what you're measuring, right? So that's something I was thinking about as I was thinking about your problem statement. So right. some thoughts that pop in my head, they're helpful. Right. No, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, the, the, the guidance counselor is, is somebody that we're going to have on board, um, you know, helping facilitating what, what the need will be as we continue if changes to our program happen. And I've worked with the principal um, and the director of science for the district um, of Hempstead, um, of Uniondale, sorry. And the college acceptance rate is 85% for the students in, the, in that high school alone. And then the graduation rate uh, was 72%. So we thought these are these these rates, 85% is really great. Um, this is a graduation rate, it can be worked on. So just using them, um, because my first thought was seeing that data, okay, well, we obviously have to work on the graduation rate. This is something that can be, you know, improved on. But the, uh, the principal also noted that the college acceptance rate is not a hundred, and this is this is something that they want to implement for this for school um, 
in Uniondale, the, 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 it's my majority African-American minority students. So to get the college acceptance rate at 100 is something that he wanted personally for, for this program to be able to do. But I'm going to continue to um, focus on the data and, and as we go on and, and focus on the need for the students. So thank you for that advice. Yeah, it might also help to talk to people who didn't graduate and understand why they didn't graduate, right? That's a good outlook, yeah. Those, those, because that's the group that didn't make it. Right. You want to know about them. Um, yeah. So that you're why did they fall through the years. cracks? Right. So that's, that's someone you want to think about more. Yeah. I don't know how you would get access to them. I know it's really hard to even get access <laughs> yeah. to them. Right. No, that's really great. But yeah, but yeah. I think that's an important group to talk to and think about because those are people who are not making it. And, right. and also it seems like you're interested in um, gearing students towards STEM and you want to think about like how that goal of yours that people actually develop an interest in STEM is related back to the graduation rate or the, or the acceptance rate. Are they actually related, right? Mm -hmm. And those two goals are I, I'm, right now I'm having trouble seeing like how those two goals are related. So I, I second that. Okay, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, also, and also you want to make, I know the principal really wants people in college, but you also want to be mindful that there are other avenues to go out there and be successful. College is not the only route. You've got trade yeah. schools, you've got businesses. So those people are also success as far as like you go. It might not be success in the principal's eyes, or that may, might not be their focus, but you have many options in terms of how you can measure your uh, success. Yeah, yeah, that sentence alone. There's many <laughs> options to be able to measure success. Yeah, and that's definitely what I um, want to bring up and, and, and focus on too, not so, have it so centered. Yeah, the advice, you know, in general here, I just want to summarize on this question. You really want to focus. Okay, it, it helps with the analysis at the end. Okay, we want okay. to, we do, we all want to save the world. I agree, okay? Yeah. We can't do that, okay? And you have to uh, crawl before you can run, because you can do all those other, other, other great things, okay? Start with the most basic problem and then grow from there. Is it that you have college graduation rate? Is it that you want to help them move from grade nine to 10, right? Is it a, do that data analysis, and I really like what Israel did there with just really going to the nuances and finding that problem, core problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm still not convinced with your solution, Israel, but uh, you are working, getting closer, right? You're going to tinker and you're going to adjust, but you're going to have that logic model in mind. What is the change you seek to, to, to create? And then what are the metrics that will inform you that you're making that uh, transition. And this goes for everyone, by the way, the whole team, even for those programs that are virtual, you're trying to do a YouTube channel, I think the concept is the same. And then the, the problem of audience. So one of our interns this summer, uh, Morgan, is, is asking that exact question. Who's the audience? How are you tackling them, especially if you're doing podcasts or vlogging, right? And how do you track impact? I mean, these are really hard problems. And you gotta, you gotta think about them. But the more focused you are, <laughs> it just gets a little easier. Um, but it's tempting to do everything. It is very tempting, but um, you should refrain <laughs> at least a little bit. <laughs> Any other comments for, from the team? Uh, sorry, you want to hog this comment? Israel, can I ask you? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Jeff. I was ask, um, um, Courtney, re really quick. Uh, if you could possibly track what major these students are taking up when they do go to college. I don't, I don't know if you keep the same cohort around for the whole time, but if you could, that may be helpful to see if you did, I guess, stimulate some interest in STEM through your um, mentorship. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Jessica? Sorry, I was muted. Israel, I think that um, your, the data is like so compelling to me just like the data that you put up and then when you graph it, the mm -hmm. difference between like Cambridge and Lexington compared, it's so striking. And in some ways I could see like you putting together almost like a case report, right? Like you have the problem so clearly laid out, you have graphs already. 
-hmm. and then basically testing whether your sort of solution, which I agree with Fanuel, I don't know if that's the perfect solution yet. Um, but I, I kind of like see that structure already coming together for you. And then my question for you was sort of more of like a philosophical question on whether, you know, a lot of the things are related to testing, but is, you know, is teaching to testing really what gets the outcomes that we want? Or is it teaching kind of more practical skills, which is what we really want to teach? And I don't, you know, expect anyone to know that answer, but I think that's just something important to think about because I think so much is focused on testing because the scores dictate the funding that goes to the schools. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's the right metric for all these different populations of students who are clearly demographically different is not totally clear to me. And um, I just think that's interesting. I don't know if you've thought about it at all. So I'm sorry, so I, I'm going to try to rephrase this a bit. <laughs> so is it that uh, what is, I guess, teaching the best way to improve upon a student's scores? Yeah, or is it that, are the test scores really that important as opposed to, like, just because you get a good score on a test, does that mean you retain the knowledge? Does that uh, mean you, like, are able to apply the knowledge? Or are we sort of, like, forcing students to perform on these tests that, like, don't really teach them skills that will be useful in the future. I don't know the answer to that. I think people have thought about this for many, many years. <laughs> I mean, I've definitely thought about that in the classroom a few times in high school too. Like, is this necessary? Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know there are some things that I remembered for a week and just completely forgot afterwards. That, I feel like I, <laughs> you're right about it. It's like a, a philosophical question. I feel like um, sort of epistemological yeah. that I can't, completely answer right now I just know like the main focus for me is uh the the students doing better on the test because I don't want to say this because it kind of sounds like an excuse I the system is the way it is I I, I don't always I don't always agree with it but since this is what's in place and it's the current barrier to these students success then I'm going to try to um help out in any way that I can to help them overcome that barrier. Um, further, when I guess like, I feel like that's more personal when you're learning on, when you're learning on a personal level, it's like, is this important to me? And uh, in high school, I don't, I don't even know if you really understand or, or like can perceive that yet, if, if you know what I mean, because you're just taking a bunch of like core subjects, none of them really get too specific on any sort of issues or any topics enough, I feel like, for you to gauge your interest yet. <laughs> yeah. I think someone should work on this on the, from the I research. Too. Uh, just My only other comment is I think that we, Fanny and I have a friend from grad school, Ime Williams, so I think we should engage, who his entire PhD was basically studying these really, really large data sets in multiple states, looking at um, basically the relationship of student performance to the ethnicity of different principles mm -hmm. and like the principles of schools. And he has like some really, really compelling data and he's now a data scientist and stuff, but I think we should kind of get him interested because I think this is like kind of right up his alley and I think he has some good ideas too, so. That sounds uh, like a great idea. <laughs> I'll ping him and see if he's, he's busy, but see if he's interested. Yeah, I think yeah, you, should, you should talk to him Ime, and pitch your project. I think, I think he would have some really good ideas for you. Yeah, so we'll make that happen for you, okay? Awesome. Cool. Um, any other thoughts, comments? I think Neba had to jump out, unfortunately, um, or she may be still here. I don't know, but I don't think she's here. Um, yeah, any other uh, comments? A quick question. Yeah. Uh, for Isra. I hope I said the name right. <laughs> well, you're good, you're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what, which? I see that you tried to separate out uh, your data by the ethnicity. Which statistical test did you use? Sorry, say that again. Which, Which statistical, statistical test? Yeah. Did you use oh, to kind of separate out the performance by the ethnicities? So this, this uh, everything that I used, I just went to the Massachusetts Department of Education website, and you can filter out for all different sorts of things. And so I, I did that. <laughs> Okay. So there was no uh, gorillaline. So there was no um, variation data. If you look at it, it's just basically raw data in terms of different schools. Uh, so there was no need test per se. I don't think you tested if there was a difference between the actual, you know, statistical difference. 
mm-hmm. and the raw number mm-hmm. that there is a difference what i'll be curious to know is the variance now i don't know if the schools are showing the variance there like i don't i don't think they share the full data set <laughs> it's just not there so ultimately this is like visualizing just in general how it is but i would like to see that distribution right and uh, metro is very noisy uh very very noisy so but there's like an actual difference but the, the different i mean the, the separation is pretty high the question is how confident are you in that uh, separation right okay uh, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Uh, Israel. So, so guys, this was, this was fantastic. I am, um, uh, our next meeting will be in July. We'll send the date over uh, soon and, um, and uh, the speaker for that. I think we're, we're going to have a guest speaker for that one. So um, I'll keep you guys posted on who that will be very shortly. I want to thank all the, the three fellows I talked today. Uh, this meeting almost didn't happen because uh, we were thinking that, you know, given everything happening right now to postpone but I think we all agreed that it was the right thing to do to have this conversation uh, given the, the, what's happening out there because it is relevant. And all the work that we're doing here today and you guys are doing um, is to, to, towards that effort of diversifying and belonging and inclusion in STEM. And I think it's really, really important. So thank you right. so much uh, for making this um, like, great presentation. And we look forward to see how your projects de- uh, develop and evolve <laughs> Hopefully we'll have. <laughs> so just uh, before we go, are you guys, so Israel and Cotton, are you guys on the SAI Slack? And if I yes. send you a message there, you'll get it. Yes, yep. yes. Because I have a, we have a bunch of questions, and uh, I think you like, uh, I could, it'd be, I'd be interested to discuss with you guys a little more. Uh, okay. Be there. That's what I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so they're, they're, oh yeah, they're all on Slack. So please, please ask him all the hard questions. <laughs> don't, don't spare any details. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you so much. I'll be hanging around a little bit if anybody wants to chat some more. Uh, but have a good Saturday and uh, we'll be keeping touch and we'll keep you guys posted. Thank you again so much. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye.